I don't know how else to say this other than to say that Bill Fertel is one of my favorite musicians of all time. Um, definitely my favorite guitar player on this earth. Oh, no. Well, I'm so happy we got to do this because we've been talking about getting together. I mean, when I first heard you, I was like flipping out. It's like, I need to get some lessons and all this stuff. <laughs> and and then all this, whatever happened, happened, and we haven't talked in a while, so. Oh, no, man, it's uh, it's so so great to, to finally get together. And I'm not going to lie, I definitely, just a lot of the questions I have for you today are things that I would have asked you in a lesson. <laughs> so I'm just going to see if I can ask them in a way that pertains to everybody else who's tuning in. Um, but the subject of this series of interviews that the three of us are doing um, for this podcast uh, center around reinvention, um, loosely speaking. And I don't think we're going to have too much of a hard time staying on topic because it feels like you breathe new life or like a new spirit into almost everything that you touch. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, of ground for us to cover um but i actually i wanted to start by asking you some questions about um a book of compositions that you released um over 20 years ago at this point oh wow yeah um like anthology of your your work that came out i think in 2000 which i've been revisiting a little bit this week and um there's there's something that you said in the preface to that which was that every time you pick up the guitar um at least 20 years ago when you wrote it um it you know or sometimes at least when you pick up the guitar it feels like you've never picked it up before um and i wanted to, to sort of see if i could ask you about that feeling is it something that's still relevant to you um oh yeah definitely <laughs> um i mean i definitely you know i know i've you know now i've been playing for uh, however many years you know it's getting close to 60 years i've been playing, you know or but it's it's that there's two you know of course i've been playing and i uh you know it's like guitar is like going home when I, I mean that's also at the beginning of all this pandemic thing you know the first thing i did was grab my guitar and it just oh, okay now i'm i'm okay now for a minute as long as i'm playing this thing but at the same time every time you touch it no matter how far you've gone it's still infinite out in front of you what you what you what you haven't done so it 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 feels the same that it always feels that way like it's just i'm just starting at the beginning every day and um that hasn't changed really um i guess i'm i'm sort of wondering how that relates to something else that's in that preface, which was a, a quote that I think was attributed to Wayne Shorter, um, where you, somebody had asked him if uh, he felt like the music flowed through him, and he said, we flow through the music. Um, and it's, it's kind of like, um, I, I guess I'm just I'm wondering the extent to which at this point, as somebody who has kind of like looked at the instrument from so many different angles, um, what is exciting or feels unfamiliar to you these days when you pick up the instrument? Um, well, that's the same thing. It's even more than ever, there's this uh 
that's what's so amazing about music is everything, every note, every song, every whatever it is you do, it it presents a question or a you know you play one note and then it's okay well what's the next note or you play it's just this ongoing you know it's like uh, you know a tree i say that a lot like branches of a tree or the way a plant grows you know it's like yeah it's like every, every action presents a, a fork in the road yeah, yeah, and and the, there's infinite ways you can go, and infinite answers to whatever that question is, and you know, it's like like a conversation. The musical just randomly play, hit anything, and it'll generate something else on, on like a what do you call it, microscopic or macroscopic, you know. If it's a song, it'll maybe it'll make you think of an another song, or if it's a composer, it'll make you think of another composer, or if it's a note, it'll make you think of another note. Um, and it just keeps on going and going. It's it's I, I used to get when I was younger, I thought. And I've talked about this so many times. You know, I used to think if I, I thought you practiced real hard and then you'd get everything together and then it, you'd just be in this kind of ecstatic state of, you know, when I'd go hear my heroes play, it's like, wow, I want to be just like that. Like thinking that every time they played, it sounded as good to them as it did to me. And that's not, I realized, along the way that that's not the way it works you know i remember being feeling the way that you just described um myself and one time you told a story about going to hear bill evans and yeah, yeah that was the like a like yeah <laughs> he had come to it was he would came to denver right and yeah you were and, there for a week and going to hear him every single night and then he the last night you you and your friends were leaving the club like ecstatic about how great the music was and you you noticed that he was standing by himself in the parking lot and like his ride had disappeared or something you like offered him a ride to his hotel and what was it that happened exactly well, well then you know we said you know we're just like shaking because he was just much larger than life godlike you know being to me and 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 we'd just been all week long we'd been flipping out like oh my god listen to, you know and then so you know to see him there we're like oh you know mr evans we just can't believe what we've been hearing all week and first thing he says oh man i just haven't i just can't get anything happening you know he's like he was really struggling and it was like whoa what do you what the what is going on you know that really flipped me out to hear him say that and then it, but it was also like a big realization that wow this is the deal you know it never and then you start thinking about, I mean, anybody that <laughs> says they've got it all together, I, I don't know. I, don't know. Oh, I mean, that, like, I feel like that story probably saved me a few years of therapy or something. <laughs> because I used to, I used to just get so upset. You know, like, I, I just felt like it was like, that part of the process was so um like I was like letting everybody down by like not being more um you know 
articulate through the music or like able to like express the ideas uh, or even understand what ideas to express. You know, like it was it was uh, something that used to really bother me every time I'd play and I'd get so down on my yeah. phone. Um, but I realized, you know, a few years later, I was playing um, in this band with, um, it was led by the drummer Marcus Gilmore. You know Marcus? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> like, Unbelievable. <laughs> yes. I've you never know, played with, I, that's, you know, he's another, I wish I could get a chance to just experience that for a second. Oh my God. It's just the craziest thing. And um, I couldn't understand why he had asked me to do it. You know, like I, I just, every rehearsal we had, I feel like I've told Marcus this if he's listening. I don't know if he's listening to this, but every rehearsal we had for this band, like I was sure that it was the last one. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, okay, like today, this is when he's going to realize that he could get, <laughs> you know, like, I don't know why I'm here. And at some point, you know, it, it was like really getting in my way, even in the situation, like I was just feeling so bad that I don't think I was like, being fully present in the situation or, you know, allowing myself to even really access like anything that oh, yeah. might be part of the reason why he'd asked me to do it, you know? And at some point I was thinking about it and I was like, you know, you think that your, um, that these feelings are like coming from a place of humility, but actually if you do, truly believe that Marcus Gilmore is this incredible, great musician, don't you think that he ought to know who he's going to call to be in this band, you know? Um, and that was when it dawned on me that I should just probably stop worrying about this kind of stuff. And like, you know, it's not, I don't know, sometimes it's like, it feels like it's not up to any of us to decide like so much of what determines the situations that we find ourselves in and it's more of yeah. try to, to do the most that we can give the most that we can yeah yeah i mean that can it can really get in your i mean what goes on in our internally while we're playing i just so often has so little to do with what the actual music that's coming out. You know, you can, well, I just actually got back from a tour, first real tour that I've done in a long time. And well, how was the music was so, it was so great just to finally get to play more than one. Okay, it was more, you know, it was a two and a half week tour and we were, you know, of course there's all the travel hassles and all that but to actually get some momentum going and really every night was a just great the music just kept but there was one night i was tripping out in my head you know it, I, I don't know what i'm saying i'm just saying that it there was nothing wrong with that one night it was just just um you know and then i get a note from someone in the a friend that was in the audience oh man it was so beautiful you know da, da, da. and I, I, you know what i'm saying it's just yeah. our own perception or or and then you you said something that reminded me this thing about humility and ego and all this stuff and when i was in school this was another like, whoa, it was like a big lesson for me. Um, I had a teacher at Berkeley, Herb Pomeroy. He said, just I, when I think back of, he's one of the heaviest musicians I ever was in the same room with. And I took all of his classes in, you know, 
arranging composition, all that stuff. And then he would, he would also, so he taught arranging and composition and then the, the students could have their, whatever their assignments, there would be a band that he would lead and play what the students wrote. And that was amazing just to be able to, and he would hear, you know, he'd look at the score and he, he could, you know, he'd pick out any tiny mistake and he would get it played the way it was as close to the way it was supposed to be played. And that way he could critique the writing or he could, but he wouldn't let the players get away with anything. You know, he wanted it to be done right. And so I also played in one of the ensembles that played the, mainly I took the writing close classes with him, but the, one of them I was playing, one, one of these ensembles I played and I forget what the, there was an arrangement of Stella by Starlight or some song and I had a solo and I, I, you know, in the whatever, and I played it. And then afterwards he said, man, Bill, you sounded so beautiful. You know, that was a beautiful solo you played. And I was like, oh man, man, I didn't, I couldn't, I didn't, I just sucked. You know, I just, I went into that whole routine, you know, oh man, it wasn't, yeah, I didn't really, I could do a lot. And, and he just came down on me. So, I mean, I thought I was being humble, right? But he turned it around. He said, so, so you're saying you know more about this music than I do? And yeah, you, you know, I mean, exactly. so can't you can't yeah. you take a compliment if I mean you played some beautiful stuff and you know, don't give me that bullshit about you can't you know, you know that was happening or so you know, I don't know. But it really it, you know it made me think, you know, I was trying to be. I was trying to be humble and, and all that, but it was like, actually I was, you know yeah. what I, mean? I think you were sort of alluded to something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's a version of it. I think there's a version of it that people do as like a projection of humility or something, but there is like this in between where it's just hard to, when you yourself have like, feel, you, you can see that like infinite expanse out in front of you, like, it's hard to accept that anything about what, you know, like, at least for me, like what little I feel like I know could possibly be worth anything. But like, <laughs> you know. but yeah, like when somebody says something like that, it's it's coming from a place that, you know, I mean, the, whatever it was resonated with someone, and especially when it resonated with her, Pomeroy, like that. Uh, Gotta just let that be what it is, I guess. Um, oh my God. Um, but, but music is definitely, it is, hum I mean, but that's where, I guess, where we have to get comfortable with the idea that we can't finish it or it's just be in it and just do the best we can. Actually, the first time that I ever spoke to you, which I'm sure that you do not remember, was at the Village Vanguard in probably 2004 or something. You were playing with Paul Motion and Joe Lovano, and I came with my dad, and it was the first time I'd ever been to the Vanguard, and I was oh wow or something, and you know I'd been listening to all the the trio records and. Um, I was so excited to be there and I thought I had some idea of what it was going to be like based on having heard recordings of the band and then the live version of it was like just this completely different you know like it in the best of ways like it it was so much more um you know whereas like I had really fallen in love with like the um sort of like the way that the recordings illuminated open space you know and like were kind of like comfortable to like show absence as like beauty and stuff you know like I, I was really fascinated with that stuff and then coming into the room like it was just like a lion roaring in my face like <laughs> so, so visceral and um 
incredible. And there's one part where I think you were sort of like in duo with Paul Motion, you generated this like tangled world of loops and like this like whole like octopus like sound sculpture and then you just let it play and walked off and Joe walked on and played solo over top of it. You know, and it was I'd just never seen anything like this and my mind was on the floor in a puddle and afterwards um you were walking through the audience. I didn't think that I could actually say words at a point and I was just like but something compelled me to stop you. And I was just like, Sarah, I'm so sorry to, you know, bother you, but that was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I was just wondering as somebody who's like starting out on this journey and just like getting into the guitar recently and stuff, if you have any advice for somebody like me. And you gave me, you, you looked around the room and then you leaned in, like you were like gonna tell me this really important secret. <laughs> And you said, just lock yourself in a room and just play for hours. And then you smiled and walked away. I said that? Or... <laughs> and That's kind of mean. <laughs> no, it was, it was actually the best advice that maybe anyone has ever given me. You know, like it was just, it was, you know, yeah, like it, it I like, regardless of where it was coming from, for me, it was like, I've never forgotten that because that has been one of the most fruitful things is to just remember that no matter what exists out there in the world, um, you know, that's inspiring or that is awe-inspiring, you know, like that the source of, all of it is like like that there's no replacement for developing a personal relationship to music and spending the time on the the questions yourself you know and spending time alone with those questions as opposed yeah. to like looking elsewhere for answers you know um yeah 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 like it's just evidence so much in your work over the years as a guitarist and as a composer in all these different settings like it even if that was like something that you said kind of offhand that you know like I, it's just always stuck out to me how much it feels like you actually did that you know um like it feels like you've looked at the guitar from all these different angles and been like well what happens if i do this and like what about this and oh that's interesting that makes me wonder what would happen if I did this. You know, like, it's just like a, oh, yeah, a yeah. very much like, and so that thing that you were describing at the beginning of this conversation about each action sort of like presenting another choice, you know, I mean, to me, that's just evidence of like this relationship that you've cultivated being grounded in a lot of ways in that kind of like you know like that there's no excuse in other words for like or no um replacement in other words for that time spent working on something yeah. Like that. um yeah that was during this last year and a half or what that was what was also reassuring or something just a reminder of how much i love I mean, I hadn't had that kind of time to just sit there with no, there was no deadline for anything. It was just uh, at the beginning of this time, I just picked up the guitar and I just started, okay, I'll just, and it, it was just a really nice reminder of how much I still love it, uh, you know, just for that with, there's no, there was no gig, there was no, reason to do anything other than just play and it and that that's more like when I think back I don't know there were times you know I had no real prospects for ever having a gig or anything you know I was teaching in a music store and I was living in this little apartment 
in Denver. And I just, I mean, of course I, you know, I wish I could get a gig maybe someday or do something, but, but basically I just sat in there and practiced, you know? No, I mean, it shows. <laughs> it shows. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. I remember somebody telling me um, that, you know, there was some interview with Elvin Jones or something and somebody was like, oh, you know, like you've developed this. I mean, there's so many things we can point to listening to Elvin Jones that feel like they came out of nowhere, you know, like um, the way that like the time feel on either side of the kit undulates like a stereo image and you know like it like kind of has this whole um i mean there's there's just so many things right and so somebody was citing a bunch of things like this and apparently elvin's answer was like oh man i'm just trying to play like kenny clark or something like that well oh, like, yeah yeah and <laughs> i was curious i mean there's like i feel like there are so many things that people can point to about the way that you play the guitar and do that feel like they kind of came out of nowhere. And I'm curious to know um, whether as you were in these early years practicing in that apartment in Denver, or even like after that, um, as you sort of like moved to New York and started playing in all these bands and stuff, whether your um like regardless of your intentions for yourself just whether your heroes were people where or i guess whether what you were excited about in listening to your heroes was some sense of wonder at like the personal aspect of their expression or whether like I, i'm just curious whether that was something that stuck out to you in the work of others because it, it surely seems like it's there in, in your own. Um, I'm not totally sure. I, I think I, I'm thinking like, it, I mean, there was, there's the part of me that's just like, I'm trying to actually just, like he said, I'm just trying to play like Kenny Clark. I mean, I'm just trying to, there's an aspect that it's just, I'm just trying to imitate something that I love like a lot of times it's not a guitar you know maybe it's Sonny Rollins or something yeah. Sonny Rollins is a big one for me too in so many like it might be just some my own just very very feeble attempt that it's you know nowhere close but I'm just trying to imitate him in some kind of way just the notes or whatever i'll play one of his songs or i'll think about him the way he might approach a song so there's just this basic imitation thing and part of that maybe what comes out is just this you know this skeleton of I'm nowhere close to it. It's just, it's just some sort of gesture towards this thing that I can never get. And in that way, you know, these, I talk about that, you know, your limitations, Yeah. that that's part of why we all sound the way we sound, you know, no, no one can just do everything. So that molds our own unique voice, I think. But then there's also the, like, if I talk about Sonny Rollins again, I'll, I'm just using him as a sort of a, he inspires me a lot, you know, just whatever he might say, or uh, there's also this other, I think you, okay, there's a thing about trying to imitate the notes, but then there's also thinking about things that I heard him say or started to think, you know, there was a point where I was 
again, back in those days in Denver in that apartment, just trying to play bebop. And I wanted to be like, I was pretending like it was 1956, but it was actually 1970 or whatever it was. And it wasn't quite, I wasn't, but then someone like Sonny, it, it, I had this realization, wait a minute, he's, if I'm going to copy him, I also have to think about what he's, what I think he might be thinking about or, or, you know, learn something about him as a person, right? So he, he would play Surrey with the fringe on top or I'm an old cow hand or, or whatever tune. And then I, read, oh yeah, that tune, he probably heard that at a, in a movie theater when he was 14 years old or something. And, and then I started to realize, oh, wait a minute, when I was 14 and I, you know, I heard Herman's Hermits and I heard, you know, and I, it's like I learned from him to just be true to my own experience, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, but... And not be afraid to, like, there, there were definitely times when I, you know, oh, I better not let anybody know that I think that song is, I like that song, because but it's kind of really corny or it's not cool, but just have to face up to your own, <laughs> whatever you like and try to put it out there. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how much like self-acceptance has been a theme of this conversation. <laughs> I think like, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I to me it's something that um you know when you talk about this thing of like um maybe reaching for something that feels like it's outside of the boundaries of what you can play or what your instrument might be expected to play. Um, I, I think that's like, I mean, it's definitely been like one of the main sources of learning for me um, over these few years that I've been doing this, but I'm kind of curious even still where, um, you know, like certain, certain aspects of um, the relationship that it, it just sometimes feels like when I hear you play the guitar and even just like, I'm not somebody that is, um, that has an easy time like watching the mechanics of music when I'm listening to it. But I recently like have tried to actually pay attention when somebody is doing something that sounds amazing, like how they're generating that sound, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I noticed that, you know, like the sort of like the space, like proximity to the, the bridge of the guitar or like the, um, the, sort of um i mean i guess the piano players like call it voicing where like there's like the weightedness of different notes in relationship to each other um you know mm -hmm. I, I guess a lot of guitar players over the years um including you know folks in the era that you were just referencing like there was this sort of um what sounds to my ear like a, a desire to level the starting point, you know, so that like you treat the notes of the instrument as evenly as possible um, in a certain sense so that like, you know, and then you can kind of, based on the way that you articulate something, you can get the like dimensionality of what notes are more present in a, a structure or something like that. Um, you know, and I, I feel like the, in listening to you, sometimes it feels like there's such a sense of like 
terrain or like um like how do i describe this like the combination of um different sorts of resonances and articulations that are possible on the guitar is so multi faceted and multi-directional you know like there'll be a harmonic that's ringing out that you like move the pick right next to the bridge to articulate and then there's like these like three or four slurred notes that are all close to each other so there's like a beating resonance in the interval and that like you can just like grab a little two second snippet of your guitar playing and like hear all of these different ways to produce sound just juxtapose next to each other and it's that's not even like you know it's before you even get into the whole space of how you then take that signal and process it with electronics and all that sort of stuff like even just if you're playing an acoustic guitar you're pulling so many different um categories of sound out of it that it it feels like it can take on this um this sort of thing where it's almost like four or five people doing a little thing, but then together it sounds oh, yeah. like a composition. I'm sorry I'm, if I'm rambling. I'm no, that's find a way to describe the thing, you know. I mean, I kind of it's nice to hear you say that it's like a comp compliment, or I think, or I, I think that has something to do with the way I'm thinking. I mean you know i don't just strum a chord i mean yeah. there's i do you know and i'd like to be able to also that's a whole lot just to play the guitar i'd like to be able to play the guitar well or good or what but but there's the thing about thinking of it more like an orchestra or you know every string every note on it has a different you know, there's a number of ways to play the same note in the same octave or whatever, but each one has its own. There's so many tones within. So I guess that's, I'm not even sure how, it's weird that you're saying this because it's, maybe it's something that I'm hoping for and I'm, I guess I'm conscious of doing Doing it, but I mean, I'm trying to think of it like a, more like an orchestra. You know, like okay, this this note has this this is a real like yeah, it's like that strong brass, and, and then there's like a like you know like harp and piano and like you know like some like yeah, yeah. it feels like this. There's or just this, there's so know. so many possibilities for dynamics and articulation within. just a a phrase or a or, or talking about i mean i never really studied formally counterpoint in school or anything but i'm thinking that way a lot like talk about when one note is a question or, or a phrase is a question and then there's an answer and then i guess i'm there's sort of this instinctual way of that's what's happening when I'm playing. It's like, well, there's that, and then, okay, there's a little answer there, and then this, and then boom, and then, and uh, yeah. I mean, you 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 describe maybe something that I'm hoping to do. I guess. I think you're doing it. I think you're doing it pretty clearly. Um, uh, I'm just, I'm curious because that feels like such a departure from what what guitar players in the era that you were just describing having been so interested in were doing. Like I'm, I'm wondering, because on some level it takes courage at some point to make the decision to approach something differently than you hear other people approach it, you know? But I think the flip side of that is also what you're saying about 
you know, like there, there is the thing that you're talking about, about limitations and, and um, feeling like you're not able to do something in a certain way. So you choose to do it in another, but what you just described about that specific aspect of your playing feels like it's rooted in a desire to actually have it sound like something else, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess um, that's the the thing that is so fascinating to me. Like, I still remember um, there was one time that um, I was, I came um, to hear you play with um, Ron Carter and Paul Motion at the Blue Note. Um, and I came with um, uh, my mentor, Billy Hart. Um, oh, so that that was in my memory. That might have been when I thought I first met you. Is that? Could that be? No, it was it was late. Didn't he say he he told me about you or something? Yeah, I, I I don't know. he was like, hey, this kid is like has all these questions. Like, can you answer some of them? And that was kind of the you know, like, but I remember asking you that day um about orchestration on the guitar, and I was kind of getting at this topic, you know, because um, I was curious to know how you had sort of um, been been thinking about this. And I remember you referred me, I was actually surprised because you referred me to this compilation that was called Hidden on All Six. And it was like a, a compilation of guitar, oh. like jazz guitar recordings. And I think there was like some George Van Epps on there and there was like a bunch of really amazing stuff, but it it all departed from what I was just describing to you in that like, you know, like there was like this sort of baseline um, pianistic sort of treatment of the guitar, I guess, like where it, it sort of feels like, and there's like so much intricacy and all the choices and like, everything's weighted really precisely and the you know it's not just like all the notes are even or something like that. there's like so much to mind-blowing stuff to unpack in those recordings but it also there feels like there's this like underlying um thing that's different where like it's almost like you're you're starting with one principle sort of even so that you can then like spring off of that into like mm. all different weightings but the the underlying thing is treating the guitar is is sort of like standardizing an aspect so that you can then kind of push it in different directions from there and have that ground to jump off of or something at least this is how my like small brain is <laughs> like interpreting what's going on but um you know whereas like it feels in your playing in relation to this question of like, you know, like hearing or imagining the guitar as an orchestra, that there is almost an opposite sort of embrace of um, how multifarious the instrument's tonal possibilities are and how um, that can be like a, a strength or like a, a really exciting aspect of it is that you can have all these different kinds of yeah it's like all coexist with each other um and i'm i'm just really curious about like where that like you know and I, i'm sorry if i'm like just trying to get further into the the answer to this question but um i'm just curious about how that came about um, because that that's definitely one of the things that when I first heard you play the guitar, I was just like, I've never heard anybody do this like this before, you know? Well, uh, I don't know if it, I mean, it, there was this, like I told you, there was this time when I was just really mm -hmm. fixated on that 
you know, Jim Hall was a West Montgomery, Grant Green, Kenny Burrell. I was just, that was, that was the zone I was in. But then I, well, a couple things, like I was hearing that, but then I was, there were things happening in the music that seemed like the guitar was a little bit, like I was also listening to, you know, Herbie Hancock, like, like Miles's quintet with Ron Carter and Tony Williams and Herb, Herbie and Wayne and all that, or Paul Blay or uh, Ornette, or there, there was this kind of stuff, stuff happening in the music that seemed like the guitar hadn't quite caught up with that somehow. And so I was, there was this area that, oh, if I could take it into that, you know, but th so that was happening. I don't know if that makes sense, what I just oh, said, but me. I, um, yeah, there, there was just something, I don't know if it's even totally true what I'm saying, but it just felt like there was, there was this uncharted, I could start to see this uncharted territory where the guitar hadn't really been still using that language. And, but then at the same time, what was happening was I was starting to let in, you know, cause I, I what got me going at the beginning was the ventures and then the beach boys and then the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Jimi Hendrix and all that, which I'd sort of, pushed aside so at the same moment i i was like wait a minute i gotta this is ridiculous for me to shut out that whole so then you start it starts getting into like even just thinking about about the just the instrument itself i mean forget about like like if you have a trumpet or a piano in your imagination that's one thing or an orchestra i'm trying to mimic that sound but just the guitar if you there's segovia and Derek bailey and Jimi hendrix and west montgomery they all are playing the same instrument tuned the same way and it's like holy you know you got to be and if you, if you let all that in then the palette the colors are just it just it's outrageous you know and there's no reason why they can't happen. Maybe there's a way to get them all to be happening at the yeah. same, you know, to coexist. It doesn't have to be one. It's not like you have to play like Jimi Hendrix now and then play like Jim Hall then, you know, they can, it, there's ways that it can all interrelate. I don't know if that has anything to do with the way you were what you were no, describing I, or i think it definitely does and i appreciate you going here with me i know it's like i i don't mean to like uh ask the same question i hope no no i i mean i want to circling the same question figure, it's I'd like so, i want to figure it out you know? oh, it's so interesting i mean that's also one of the most incredible things about the history and all the the music that you just mentioned kind of you know like hearing ornette and miles's quintet and all this sort of stuff like there's such a history of this kind of precedent to like look at where people were just like oh yeah i love all of this music and all of these people you know stood on the shoulders of these other things but they also like in almost like the best way to pay tribute to all of those artists that you love is to understand that they all forged a personal relationship to what they were doing, you know, and that, that at some point that imitation went 
further into this direction of asking these kinds of questions of yourself and trying to see like, okay, well, in my practice, is there a way to like, um, find something to contribute to this conversation, you know, or like, is there something that like, is exciting to me that I can explore um, further? I, I don't know. Um, but it, it's certainly, you know, I guess another branch of this is like, in the early period of your recorded music, there's, you know, there are periods where you were, I guess, experimenting with guitar synthesizers and, you know, you were, you were also interested in, um, you know, like you were, you were playing the instrument in stereo and you were kind of thinking about um, delays and loops and all these sorts of things. And I kind of wanted to ask you a bit more about your relationship to some of that stuff, like how it came about and um, whether you were, you know, like the extent of your relationship to electronic music and people who were using those kinds of tools, you know, and, and using the studio as a, a compositional sort of tool, you know? Um, like, I, I guess, um, you know, I, I know that there's uh, reference points for it, even in some of the music that you just mentioned, like people like Jimi Hendrix or the Beach Boys, like those records, um, the way that the music is presented takes, rather than taking a documentary sort of perspective, oh, yeah. capturing a sound as it exists in the world, the sound is developed through the process of making a record like that and I, I'm just curious when it was that you started to become interested in aspects of that because it seems like they fed into the way that you then were playing the guitar um yeah that oh well it I mean it see uh, most of it grew out of that that thing about having a sound in my head that was, you know, trying to reach for this, you know, when I first got a fuzz tone, it was actually, I heard, I've told this story so many times, but it really came a lot from, I was sort of hearing a trumpet sound or something. It's like, I heard Santana, like I heard, like Santana played this long, he's playing a guitar, but it's like this long sustained note. And then like, if you just chop that, if you dropped in, if you took a tape and right in the middle of that note, it's like, wait a minute, that sounds like a, sounds like Freddie Hubbard playing a trumpet or something. So that's what kind of got me thinking about just distortion. It wasn't so much thinking about Jimi Hendrix distortion or yeah. it was more trying to get this sustained sound or then you know then I got a volume pedal so you can shape so, the back of the note yeah yeah and, and have it grow have it get louder instead of just always dying away um, and then I would get a delay because it was sort of being like pushing the sustain pedal on a piano and the note, a chord could ring out longer or something like that. It was always, most of that was generated by being jealous of what some other instrument was able to do. But then what happened, I think there was, my friend Robert Quine, do you know? His name, his guitar player, he played with, I guess he's known more like as punk, in the punk thing. He played with Richard Hell in the Voidoids, and then he played with Lou Reed for a while. And I, uh, I was introduced to him in the early 
soon after I moved to New York, early 80s, I met, I met him. And anyway, he, he was the one that brought this, there was this electro harmonic 16 second. We had this jam session and he brought, oh man, I just got this new thing. It's this electro harmonics 16 second delay. And that thing was like, oh my God, you know, I plugged into that and it was just this instantaneous, my, my brain just went crazy, you know, because for making loops, it there was a period of 16 seconds that you could deal with, with a switch, it would go from eight to 16. So, you know, if you played something and then you capture it and then you turn the switch and you could make it go up an octave or down an octave it's another switch to make it go backwards and then you could you could it was like having this weird little recorder thing you know you could put capture something in there and then add something else to it or change the speed of it and then put something else in and then you could have things regenerate in some, you know, just did all this. I wish they, I, I, I finally have another one now that works after wow. they're hard to find. And there's still nothing that really does what that thing yeah. does. And, but that was, that was where all the time. Is that the one that records all the time? Like, so if you like engage the thing, it's just like constantly recording loops. So there's always something in its memory. Is that, um, or is it? Well, not if it's, you have to. You have to start it. Yeah, you have to open it up. But, but I mean, you could have a, like you, uh, there's two switches, you know, like if you, you have the loop going, and it can be just locked in there. And then you you can undo the switch and add something else to it and then turn it off again. So like you could play a like play a chord and then just turn the switch off and on real fast and it'll just capture just a chunk. Um, so it was this way of it like it was actually became this sort of compositional. It just was so natural to me the way it was so easy to use and uh, quick, and it just somehow fit with the way my brain was working. It, but it would. What I'm getting at is that it was something completely separate from playing the guitar. It was like, oh well, I can organize these bits of sound in this certain way. And so that sort of that's what the moment that this became this other it was like having another instrument that I was messing with. And it was also very unpredictable. It wasn't, you couldn't, you never get exactly the same thing back at the same time. Or, you know, if you try to do something rhythmically in the right spot, it would never come out right. Or so it, it there was this element of chance that was also awesome because it it would throw a wrench in the works all the time which was i like that thing that you when you mentioned hearing paul it could have i don't know if i still had that at that point then i though they eventually died and <laughs> couldn't get them fixed and but um but I liked it because it would it would like throw something back at me in some unexpected way, and then I'd have to respond. Yeah. You, know, you try to either fix it or you try to <laughs> play something against it that would make it make sense. Or um, it's like having this kind of anarchistic robot thing there that would just mess with you or something. So. But that 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 started this whole other. It's like I I don't. It's almost like it's not the the guitar at all. It's I mean the guitar could feed the information. That's why I really want to hope we can get together. 
sometimes because you, you were doing this stuff. I have no idea. Like for me, you're doing some things that I was, I'm trying to describe now, but it's, I, I can't even, I don't have no idea what, how you're doing what you do. So I'm trying to be like you, man. <laughs> no, no, it's no, that anyway. Um, um, but hopefully we'll have a chance to do that. Sometime. That would be the most amazing thing. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, one of my favorite records of all time is the one that you made with, um, Dave Holland and Elvin Jones. Um, and I think it came out like around the time that I was first getting interested in the guitar and stuff. And, you know, I'd probably been playing for a few years. And I mean, that just, I didn't understand what was happening or like how you had made that. And I think that it subconsciously had this huge impact on my whole like sensibility, you know, like the, they're like aspects of what I was just talking about, about the, the, um, the way that the studio can kind of function as an extension of like what, oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, um, a place and it sort of like was part of what set me off on this obsession of like trying to find ways to bring that back into like, the the way that you end up playing with other people or like to to bring that sort of world of sound back into the improvised space you know um because i remember hearing it and i just couldn't tell like what had come first or how things like what had been there originally but the line between like what um happened in the room that day and what i was hearing like i knew it was somewhere but i didn't know where it was in the best of way you know like it just all felt like this outgrowth of um what was there and it's still one of my favorite things like the um the version of again on that record is oh yeah it's just uh, anyway i can i could go that, on a, yeah that's wild that i have to go and listen again because there were places that actually that again that's i don't think there i don't i'm not now i have to listen i don't think there's any overdubs on that but i'm not sure where well, are there there's acoustic guitar oh there is oh, okay i'm sorry okay yeah because there i did yes yeah, so, okay there is that's why but there's oh, a, yeah. there's definitely some other stuff oh, okay yeah but that one i'm using that delay thing a lot so there's you know there's definitely but a lot of that was live so but yeah and i think there's other tunes on there where i went back and like a melody where there was i had written sort of mm -hmm. three or four part almost like horn parts that I harmonize the melodies with and stuff. Um, I need to go back and kind of review that record. There, yeah, there, uh, that was such a incredible to get to be with those guys. You know, I'd, I'd known and played with Dave a little bit before that, but Elvin, I just barely, actually Paul Motion introduced me to him one time. I shook his hand one time a few years before that. That was all. And then uh, Michael Shreve, the drummer in Santana, the, he, a friend of, he, he's a friend of mine, from Seattle and he that's how it he had it in his mind that, that I should he had known Elvin I love this story about him meeting Elvin he went so Michael is like I think he's he's just a couple years older than me I never got to see 
Coltrane Quartet, right? But Michael, when he was, I guess he was in high school or he was young and he wanted, he wanted to see, wanted to see John Coltrane's quartet, but he was too young to get in the club. So I'm not sure if I should check these facts with him. I, I might have, but the basic thing is he somehow he snuck in. Right. My memory is that he actually climbed in some window and dropped down into the, yeah. the bathroom so he could get in. Somehow he got into this back room of the club and I can picture this kid just sort of dropping down on the floor and he looks up and there's Coltrane and McCoy and they're all in there. And it's like, hey kid, what are you, you know, what are you doing? And he, you know, I really want to hear the music. And so they invited him and that's where he met Elvin for the first time. And they became friends and, you know, and then a few years later, he's playing with Santana and they, they're, keep their friendship going. And however many years, 25 years later, he gets it in his mind that I should play with Elvin. So he was the one that really hooked up this whole, you know, it was an arranged, I don't think Elvin knew who I was or anything, but thanks to him, it, I got to play with Elvin and, but it was such a brief, you know, we, I had gotten together with Dave to go over some of the music and, um, you know, everything was going through Elvin's wife. So, you know, she wanted to make sure that, you know, she was really watching out for him. You know, he's okay. He's just going to be at the studio. We've got two days in the studio, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And so we get to the studio the first day and setting up and you know time is good. let's see where is elvin you know he's not here yet and <laughs> we've only got two days and it time kept passing and it's oh man we better so we call and he says oh man i thought it was tomorrow you know he didn't so then he rushes over there we barely had the first day was almost just setting up and maybe did something and then we had the second day to play so it's just you know, it was a few hours with him, but he was so incredible, the openness and willingness to play this music. And um, I mean, so, you know, people have this, why did you play? You know, I played that Stephen Foster song, Hard Times with him, and I got some flack for that from a few you know how could you dare ask elvin to play this stupid folk song or whatever you know and i was like well man you weren't there you know he was so into it you know because i was thinking about before the thing i was thinking about his you know he plays the guitar too right yes. and his the whole blues thing that's in his anyway he was just super, he said, wow, you know, that I, he was talking about big Bill Brunzi and he said, yeah, I did these gigs with Pete Seeger and all this stuff, you know, and, I mean, he was talking about playing with, with Duke Ellington and he was, and he played with Pete Seeger too, you know, and um, he was open to the whole thing. That, I just can't believe I got, and then we were, you know, we were, he was we talked about doing more and then you know he got got sick and then it never we didn't get to play anymore but so it's just that one little yeah snapshot that i got there which was i just i feel so lucky so do i <laughs> i feel lucky that it exists because it's been such a meaningful recording for me um over the years and and that's also one of my favorite recordings of Elvin. Um, wow. And there are so many incredible ones, but that one is really special. And um, I, I just think it's, it's really cool that he was also 
you know, like that there is a recording of him playing in a setting like that. Um, that's so beautifully captured and stuff. Like, I, I feel like there is one aspect of it in particular that I remember when I first got like a set of really good, like, reference monitor, you know, like studio monitors to be able to like, oh, wow. sound design and stuff. And I set them up and that was like one of the first things that I played and I was amazed because all of a sudden I could hear all the stuff that I had never heard in the recording before. Oh, wow. And the things that I love about it is that you can hear Elvin like vocalizing the whole time. Like, oh, man really really audible like you can like hear everything like about how i gotta it. i'm gonna go back because i haven't really listened i don't go back and that you know again that's my friend lee townsend who's produced so many of my records he he was in on that you know and and joe furla was the engineer you know I, i've been so lucky to be surrounded by these guys that are watching i mean i don't i can't take credit for any of that stuff that's like i just been i've got a lot of backup you know with lee has produced i don't know 80 percent of my albums and and then the you know with whether that was joe furla back then and then uh, James Farber, engineer, and Tucker Martin. Um, now I have to name all the. I've I've been lucky with Adam Munoz, uh, Judy Clapp. There's like amazing engine, like incredible engineers that I've been able to work with, and Lee is always there. Like he's sort of the. Uh, I don't have to work like he's like obsessively <laughs> watching out for stuff. And so I don't have to think about it. I'm just trying to play. And then I'm not good at also not knowing, not judging my own. I don't, well, that sort of relates to what we were talking about before, like, especially in the studio it's so easy to get really crazy in your own head and not really know whether it's good or bad or what it is. So I trust him with that kind of stuff too. Yeah. But, yeah. All of them. But I do get comment, you know, like that, that people comment about, Oh, wow. That record sounds really good. And, um, I can't take credit for that part of it. I think I think there's a sizable um, aspect of that that comes from just the sound. But I mean, yeah, I I feel like you can because the source of all of it is like the sound of what came. Well, hopefully, from. you know, like it's like. Yeah, um, I feel like I could continue to ask you so many more questions, but I want to be mindful of your time. I, I appreciate you being a part of this so much, um, and I, I'm so glad that um, I got the chance to talk to you today. Thank you. Um, me too. I've been, like I said, I hope I'll have more. I mean, I'm still, I, I'm not in a hurry if you want to talk more but um oh. but i just been i don't know we we keep crossing crossing paths just every once in a while and, you know, i gotta pick your brain about some stuff oh. it's definitely yeah at least as much the other way around probably a lot more the other way around um, definitely a lot more the other way around. Well, I mean, I'm happy to keep talking and and asking questions. I know um, uh, Chris is gonna edit all of this down, so we're not. 
Okay. I mean, we can keep going if you want. I'm okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess maybe just could I ask you a few more questions and then sure. Um, make it make it work together. Um, yeah, because I'm I'm actually some of what you were just saying was bringing up some questions I have about your um, well, let me like start with a clean phrase so that you can cut it. So um, what what you were just saying was bringing up some questions for me about your process in the studio in some of these situations. Um, you know, like I, I'm curious whether there are like things that you've tried exploring in the format of like, you know, just with the mindset of like how microphones and all these things translate what's happening in a space different than like the human ear might, you know? And I, I'm curious whether there have been any like experiments that you've done in a studio setting that felt kind of strange like in the room, but then when you heard how it sounded behind the microphones informed the way that you approached oh wow thing wow i'm not um i mean so many times so many things i do are more just hoping for a it seems like most of the records i make are it's a band that i'm just trying to get the sound of the band but then maybe that thing about spicing it up a little bit here and there, I don't know, but, or, or, but mainly I'm just hoping to get comfortable with the way we're hearing each other so we can actually, I mean, it doesn't, uh, yeah, it's like this, there's the scale of one extreme to the other with that stuff, you know? Um, like just not using headphones and all playing in the same room and um, to, you know, have everything isolated and controlled and all that. Um, and so I've done just every, every possible, uh, from one extreme to the other. I'm trying to think of examples like, well, like I fairly recent, record I made that just alone that um, music is it's just me alone and that that one I was thinking more somewhat what what you were talking about um, I was almost thinking of like a, a mobile or something like things I had that kind of possibility you know, some of it was just naked guitar, but then I had a lot of guitars in the studio and I had different amps and I had things that I could grab quickly and things were set up so I wouldn't have to, anytime something came into my mind, I didn't have to, we didn't have to, okay, now we got to set up a whole nother thing or do this or, you know, I could just, it could be super spontaneous in the moment, like, oh, wow, why don't I, add this or do that and but th that one I was really thinking about more about the space where things and we mixed it also that was different we mixed it as we went along so the mixing yeah. was part of the composition in a way where a lot of other times I would you know go in with a band or whatever we play and then we mix it sometime later but this was everything, the mixing and the, almost the writing to, you know, I was, I had written some new music or was all really happening in a super integrated, the, the, the lines between the arranging and the writing and the mixing and all that was all just completely blurred together with that album. Uh, 
do you in general tend to like be present when albums are being mixed and and kind oh, of be a part yeah. of it? Yeah. But that's also that's where I, I have this sort of luxury with Lee because my my attention span and my I could burn out real fast. I mean, I don't like to listen to myself over and over again. So what the process usually is him and the engineer like that one well it happened last few records has been with tucker martin and they also you know they're super close friends they've done a million things together so when we mix usually they'll do all this you know tucker will go through and whatever each track and clean up this and fix that like kind of maintenance stuff and then they start doing real mix mm -hmm. but i'm not i just stay out of yeah. all that so 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 then by the so they get something that they like and then then i'll come in so i'm hearing it and that that works great because then i can oh well you know that thing should be louder or this or that and i and I'm, my ears are not totally blown out by that time so it's kind of a another luxurious way to get to do it. So, so I am I'm totally involved with it. But man, I I don't have the. I know some people are have that stamina. I I, I just burn out real fast if I have to listen to myself over and over again. I'm listening to anything over and over again. I, there's a another episode of this podcast with um the mixing engineer that sunlux works with a lot um who's a somebody that we all really look up to this guy chris tabron and he there was an interview with him that i had read and i've talked to him about this a bunch of times but his whole process sort of centers around listening to whatever he's working on like kind of as little as possible you know um so that mm -hmm. he's been like hear things objectively before they acclimate acclimate to certain aspects of them you know um yeah so i feel like what you're saying in a way is like i mean that's just true for everyone um you know for somebody even if somebody like him is still like trying to find ways to limit their exposure yeah to them, must all need it but um I also, I was curious about um, the, you know, some of the collaborations that you've done in other media, um, especially like some of the work you've done with, with film and, and visual art. Um, I, when I was at Big Ears a couple years ago and you were there, I got to hear you guys play um, with the, the films of Bill Morrison. Uh, oh, yeah and that was so great but yeah i'm i'm just curious about what um you know whether there are any i mean I, I recognize that every situation is different and every project probably has different um uh inspirations or needs or whatever but i, I was just curious um if you could speak to like what your experience has been like working with um with film and and whether like there's anything that has um you know any different considerations or any ways in which it's informed other areas of your work yeah that's been that well you mentioned bill morris and that was and then you were talking about elvin and dave holland that working with bill has been like this really it started out i met him he was actually a dishwasher at the village vanguard in like whenever it was in the 90s or something i guess when i first met i didn't even know he made films and then he asked me if he could use some of my music for a film that he had made and this is long ago, and then 
things kept kept talking about doing something and he there was this I think we did that at Big Ears, a film called The Mesmerist. I'm yeah. not sure. And, but for that, this was such an awesome way to really get connected with Bill. It, for that film, he used two pieces from that Dave Holland and Elvin Jones thing. So he, he had the film and then he, he made the film and then he used however it's like 20 minutes of music or whatever it, it and he edited the film to that music so it was it was like this kind of template for me like he did all the work and then later we could play it live you know i could oh i don't have to figure anything out i just play those you know, we play these pieces and we, but we're still responding to the film and that, and that, then that started this whole relationship with him where then we, later we did uh, this film, The Great Flood. Did we do that? I'm not sure. That's a much longer, it's, it's a, this archival footage of the, Mississippi River flood in 1927. And uh, that was incredible experience doing, because that that's where we really started working on something from the ground up, like the idea came and then we, we talk about it. We, we traveled together up and down the Mississippi River with the band wow. and it just happened to be flooding when we were doing it too, which was unbelievable. Um, so it was like we were, and the music came about as the film was coming about. And how did it work? Were you developing both of them? Like, were you and Bill both developing things in isolation or were you sending things? Yeah, well, we were together for this trip like all we went to new orleans and memphis and all we went all the way up and the the film so he and he was gathering it's all old footage from that time and it's sort of it's just this more of an impressionistic well there's literal stuff but it it tells the story of the this unbelievable just devastating horrible flood that just basically you know wiped out the whole middle of the country and you know was you, you you hear about it in so many old blues songs or whatever you know and it had a lot to do with the migration of black people from the south up to chicago and you know, so it gets into this whole thing about how the music actually changed from rural to in, you know, electricity and muddy waters and, you know, coming from down there and then going up to Chicago and plugging in. And so there's this sort of that it's a huge story you know but it's not this film is not a it's not like a documentary or anything i don't know how to um yeah no i mean it, it's like a more impressionistic sort of yeah and but just to be able to do it you know i would was sort of working on the music with the band as we were on this trip and then we'd have tapes and you know we'd tape we'd do a gig and we'd tape the music and then bill would edit or he'd find something that made sense for whatever that music was and yeah. so it's totally you know so many times you'll get the, you'll get the film and then you put the music on at the end or something you know it was just great to be able to 
have it be that kind of back and forth thing the whole way. Um, but that's rare, the, the kind of relationship with him. I mean, I've done, the very first thing I ever did was the, these Buster Keaton films. And that was a just a, I had no idea. And I still don't know what I'm doing when I'm doing film music, but that was like, just absolutely just like throwing paint at the wall and just hoping that something would be recognizable or something. Um, it was total panic, but it was a an amazing way to just jump into doing it because I felt like it was, you know, there's no real official, it's not like Charlie Chapman had written the music for his fit or whatever. I felt like it was a, it was okay that there wasn't any official Buster Keaton music that went with those films. I felt like it was open territory for me to just do whatever I want. And so that was where I first did it and where I really could, I just learned so much by just complete haphazard acts. I wonder what this sounds like if it's with that. And, and then not long after that, Gary Larson, the cartoonist who I actually Jim Hall introduced me to him in Seattle and we became wow. he's he was real close with Jim Hall and um that's how I met him and we were neighbors in Seattle. He's like a really great guitar player. Oh wow. And I we I end up we just I'd go over to his place and we just play tunes and stuff and then he had this special a uh, television special animated show of his cartoons that was i can't believe it was they actually had tv shows back then it's this was in the mid 90s i guess um on cbs it was like a halloween special and so he asked me to do the music for for that and that was great because there wasn't any dialogue either it was all music so having done the buster keaton thing it was kind of a great next step to that's a while i i haven't done that much film stuff but it what i like about it it always pushes me you know it it, it corners you right yeah. like if you have to you have to figure out something that's going to work with something. And then there's a certain amount of time that you have to do it. You know, I mean, I love just being able to write music with no boundaries or just let your, but with that, it's like, uh Oh, I got to Yeah. So it'll, it, it limits you. But at the same time, it, it, I think it has forced me to find some stuff that I maybe wouldn't have found. Yeah, the three of us on Sunlux just finished scoring our first film together. And um, oh, wow. Ryan, Ryan has done it a few times, but Ian and I, um, this is like the first feature film that we had done. And it is was it like a film, like a, like a film film, like a, it's a movie with dialogue. And I, I mean, it's, it's oh, wow. honestly like totally insane. and it's i think it's like two hours and 10 minutes long or something but oh, an hour and 50 minutes of original score wow that's incredible yeah so it but it was i mean i've never done anything like that before and the process of kind of having to figure out how you can um support or give voice so like gestures that are happening on screen and then also have that be kind of like like you have to zoom out from that and not yeah really, like you can quickly if you get too far in the details you're just like it's like the thing in music where like somebody's taking a solo and you're accompanying them and you just start playing back all the stuff that they're playing you know and it's uh, like, oh yeah yeah <laughs> it or something like 
but there's the um you know like the underlying kind of um aspects of of trying to support something else while also developing a broader idea and it was just mind-blowing for me because yeah you know i guess it's one thing to make music that like is evocative of you know um what people associate with like cinema and sound design and, and stuff like that um and then it's another thing to like make music when there's also a whole separate department of people who are doing the sound design, you know? Oh yeah, yeah. Doing amazing stuff and like, yeah. So it was, it was a huge learning experience for us, but I uh -huh. was thinking about that stuff that you did um, with Bill Morrison, you know, just because there's so much, um, when I saw it, I, I enjoyed how like, even when everything, what it wasn't like every little gesture was tightly choreographed to the picture, but there were ways in which it would intersect and um, yeah. sort of moment, you know, like choosing the moments for that. And then another thing that the directors kept talking about was like waiting for like leaving space between the musical sort of like, um, support for a moment on screen as opposed to having it land right with the realization because like yeah or you have to process what's happening in order to then feel the feelings you feel in response to that and if you oh yeah with the event you're stealing the thunder from the the visual you know um yeah that stuff is so so interesting and did, were you did you feel with the director you were on the same wavelength and everything like that i mean it, I, we got really lucky because um even though it was so much music and it was all like very tightly you know like we were like scoring it all to the picture basically like there's very little that we um didn't actually write like at the end of the day that wasn't either you know in response to what was on screen or um i guess some of it was stuff that we actually wrote before they even shot it that they cut it you know cut the picture to oh um, yeah that's cool because that, they came from a music video kind of background um like they'd done a lot of that sort of thing before they started making feature films so music is a pretty important part of their process and oh that's awesome came to us for like really specific reasons so it was it was cool that it was you know like we were at, being asked to like at least be ourselves in that situation. right that's so that's huge like so you weren't being yeah no that's awesome yeah it was it was really great and just like a, a very eye-opening <laughs> experience for me and i just felt you know the throwing paint at the wall analogy is is pretty accurate in describing my experience with it certainly like it felt like it was it's really just like right before we finished it that i started feeling like i even understood what was going on a little bit like yeah you know there's so much all of these spaces there's they just open up like full expanses untraveled you know yeah i mean there's so many the way your mind one thing that got me off the hook early on when i was trying to i put on some aaron copeland music or something i had some i don't even know what the film was. i just put the film on and i put the music on it was like you know your mind makes all these oh wow that hit just right when this thing happened part of it you know your mind will make the connections anyway if, if the music is totally good and the... yeah um okay well i won't take up any more of your time but i'm i'm so so grateful to you for for being a part of this and, and well thanks for having me yeah thank you so much um 
and um, I really hope that we can have another again <laughs> sometime soon. Yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, thanks. Where so where are you now? In uh, Crown Heights. Oh, okay. Brooklyn, so like just a block away from the Brooklyn Museum. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I'm not far. From, I mean, I'm Ditmas Park. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's not far at all. Um, yeah, if there's any, ever a time that would work, just let me know and I'll be there. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, no, thank you. This was fun. <laughs>